Okay, so Amanda Benham. Amanda is just over to your right. And she is accredited practicing dietitian and an accredited nutritionist. She specializes in plant-based nutrition. She has more than 20 years experience in helping people adopt better eating habits to achieve optimal nutrient intake and better health. And she's published in this area. Amanda's just recently opened your store. The, the, how far, how long have you been there in West End? Yeah, how, how long? So, for about six months, um, Amanda's had human herbivore here in West End, and that's just above Coffee Club, was it? Um, yeah, if you know the area. And Amanda teaches at QUT, where she is currently undertaking a PhD on vitamin B12. Amanda's going to talk to us about B12 later on. She has been vegan for 33 years, and she has two lifelong vegan children who are 28 and 26. And Holly, just over here, you might know her as Holly George before she was married. And she's got a little bum over here. I just saw Tim. Yep. And um, she, Holly Moffat, is a vegan specialist naturopath. Since qualified Bachelor of Health Science, she has practiced clinical naturopathy for the past seven years. She joins us today after taking nine months maternity leave for the birth of her daughter Zephyr and is excited to answer all questions in regards to vegan fertility, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Then in the middle, we've got Sarah Farley. Sarah Farley is a plant-based naturopath with a passion for healthy, cruelty-free living. She enjoys working with people transitioning to a vegan diet, already established vegans interested in optimizing their health and reaching their ideal nutrition needs. Sarah focuses on using food as medicine, using a holistic, spiritual and scientific approach to healthcare incorporating herbs, lifestyle, mind, body, and soul. Please give all three of the lovely ladies a round of applause. So um, I'm going to ask everyone a few questions, then we're going to have some specific ones that relate to each of the ladies. So um, in case you're not aware, hopefully most of you are, but if you eat a whole foods, varied, low fat, vegan diet, you should get all the, the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you need. There are a few vitamins that um, we're going to go over specifically later, um, but first I'd like to reiterate to everyone, in case you don't know, you can get protein from a vegan diet. So, um, I'm going to start with that. What's everyone's favourite protein source? Mine is tempeh, especially from Indonesia. I'm going to have to go with hummus. Um, as a new mum, hummus is brilliant on everything, even really bizarre combinations. Hummus with Vegemite on toast was a hot favourite for the first couple of weeks there. So, definitely hummus. Um, I would have to say tofu. So versatile, you can't favourite tofu. Um, I don't really think in terms of, of protein that I eat, but I do eat beans every day. We like black beans and kidney beans, so I guess that's one. Yeah, I like that. Um, I'm going to eat. I'm going to ask each of the girls to focus on a particular nutrient or two. Um, so Amanda's going to talk about vitamin B12, as that's her specialty. Holly next to me is going to talk about calcium and omega threes, and Sarah's going to talk about iron and vitamin D. So Amanda, um, we'll start off with the hard one, um, vitamin B12. So can you tell us why we need it? What's your favourite source? and when people should supplement. So vitamin B12 is the most elusive nutrient to find in plant-based food. Um, it wasn't closer, sorry. It's the most elusive nutrient to find in plant-based foods and it wasn't discovered until uh, 1948, so it's relatively recent and prior to that it would be quite be difficult to be on a vegan diet. So we're all very lucky that vitamin B12 got discovered. Um, so I actually recommend that people start supplementing with vitamin B12 if they're on a mostly plant-based diet. 
um, because studies have found that people who don't supplement if they're on a plant-based diet can become deficient and that's something that you really want to avoid. Uh, what was the other question? Oh, okay. So favourite sauce, um, well, probably favourite, it's just something that you do to stay healthy, is take um, a chewable tablet or a lozenge. Uh, you can get liquid as well, which is great for little kids. And the form to take is called cyanocobalamin. I recommend that form. That's the form that's the most stable, the most research has been done on it. If you don't take that, you need to take a combination of methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin. Those are the two active forms that the body needs, um, but cyanocobalamin is more stable and you can go to both. So I hope that makes sense. So at least 100 micrograms a day is what's recommended, or you could take a high dose like 2,000 micrograms once a week. So it's not difficult to do, much better than having to um, support animal exploitation in my opinion. So many people, can everyone hear me at the back? So I want to ask, um, a lot of people say vegans, we don't need anything, we've got it all from our plant-based kingdom, we've got it all from that. Um, what can you say to people that are like, I don't need this vitamin B12, I'm vegan, I'm covered. Unfortunately, over the last 33 years, I have met people that have said that, and, and vitamin B12 is sometimes stored for a long time, not necessarily, and we can recycle some of it. So unfortunately, I've seen quite a few of those people inevitably become deficient, and the problem is by the time you're deficient, irreversible damage is being done. So I think we have to think about, well, humans have eaten animal products for tens of thousands of years. Um, we, we do produce vitamin B12 low down in our gut, but it's too low down to absorb, so our feces are full of B12, but obviously we don't want to eat feces, which is how some other animals do get their B12, it's from eating their own feces, so definitely don't recommend that. Um, I think that we've got much more sterile conditions these days, which stops us getting from food poisoning, so we're not just wandering around pulling vegetables out of the ground and eating them, because uh, vitamin B12 is in bacteria that's in, in soil, but you can't get enough B12 just from eating organic vegetables or something, I really don't recommend you try and rely on that. So I guess my answer is really, well, in modern times, um, you know, what's natural, even nothing humans do is natural, or everything we do is natural. So we're not trying to live natural lives, we've all got mobile phones and computers and things like that, and we wear clothes, and, and I think that taking a, a little tablet, to me, is a lot more natural than um, having to go out and kill animals or hurt animals. So I just think that um, this is part of our evolution. Uh, we have the science now to know how to be vegan, to be healthy as vegan. So uh, that's what we should do. Holly, I'd like to know about calcium next. So why do we need calcium? What's your favorite sort? And when should someone supplement? So I really like to talk about this from the point of view as um, from fertility and pregnancy and obviously breastfeeding. Um, and these areas really increase your need for calcium. So when we look at a general vegan diet, we have a lot of our foods that are supplemented, especially soy milks and things, they're gonna be uh, supplemented with calcium. Um, also a lot of our natural food sources like almonds, tofus, um, our green leafies are all really, really high in calcium as well. But you do need to be eating a varied diet and you do need to be eating um, quite an abundance of these foods and vegetables. So the best way really is to have a just general check-in every now and again. Um, there's really, really great apps now that you can just plug in a general sort of daily dietary intake and just see where you're tracking with these nutrients. If it's looking like you may be a little bit low, you might want to be increasing these foods in and bringing them in a little bit more. And obviously when you're pregnant and breastfeeding, you're growing another little human person. And these little humans have bones and have an added need for calcium as well as a whole abundant um, another section of nutrients that you'll be taking. So generally, vegan or not, I often recommend that my clients supplement with calcium when they are pregnant and breastfeeding, just to have that you know, overview. So if you're having a busy day, if things are getting a bit chaotic, you've always got that little catchment there. And Sarah, I'd like you to speak about iron. So why is it important? What's your food, your favourite food source? And when should someone supplement? So I've found that um, vegans tend to eat tend to eat more iron than omnivores. Um, however, if not mindful of phytates, you can severely reduce your absorption. Um, for example, 5 to 10 milligrams of phytates can reduce your absorption of iron by 50%. And to prevent this from happening, you can activate your nuts, seeds and grains. Um, you can avoid tea and coffee with meals. 
by about an hour. That's really important, I think. Um, and also to increase vitamin C, which can also help with the uptake of iron. And some really good sources are beans, dark leafy green vegetables, tofu, molasses, spirulina, and nettle. Um, Holly, another one. Um, why do we need omega-3s? Favourite source? When should someone supplement? So, according to Dr. T. Colin Campbell, if we're eating a whole food plant-based diet, as in always whole food plants based, not full of refined and sort of processed foods, we're going to get enough omega-3. Generally, unless your diet is really on point, we're not following that. You know, we've got all these lovely mock meats and we've got coconut ice cream outside and we've got all these lovely things that are really abundant to us now in the vegan community, which is awesome. But if you're not really on point, you're not going to be always getting these omegas. Now, I want to just, just stay with me, a little bit of biochemistry, but we're going to split omega-3 into EPA and DHA. And just EPA, I always think, um, you know, achy joints, arthritis. That's generally why people take this um, uh, EPA. And DHA is brain. So, of course, I've grown a really advanced, super super clever daughter. <laughs> Not biased, but she's... <laughs> I've been taking omega-3 um, during my pregnancy and I'll take it during my breastfeeding years as well because she's taking a lot of that DHA in and through my breast milk and that's helping her brain um, function and grow basically. Also when we think about our, our adult brains, mood support is a really, really important part of DHA. Now we used to think flaxseed was the best vegan form, not so much anymore. We're thinking maybe it's not being converted as well as we need it to be. So algae, generally when people think omega-3, they think fish oil. They go, oh, you're not eating fish, where are you getting it from? The algae. So the step before fish, basically, we're going to the little bottom feeders. So just like a lot of things with our vegan diet, we eat the food that their food eats. If that makes sense. So we're just going to the algae. We should get a really um, great abundance of supplements these days that have a really good balance of that in. And I'd just like to give a shout out to Holly for her first um, appearance after having her lovely daughter. <laughs> Um, um, Sarah, I'd like to know about vitamin D. We're in, living in a sunshine state. Do we need? Do we need it? Do we need to supplement? Can we be getting it through our food? Okay, so the best source of vitamin D is from the sun, um, and back and tummy exposure seems to be best. The best places to absorb, so the back of the, the back of your body and also your tummy. And just 10 minutes a day in the midday sun can give you 10,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, and the recommended daily intake, or the RDI, is 600 to 1,000 milligrams. So I'm not suggesting that you go out and sunbake in the middle of the day, but just a quick 10, 15 minutes in the sun can definitely give you your RDI of vitamin D. Thank you. So um, while we're talking about supplements and nutrients and things like that, I just want to ask everyone on the panel if they do take supplements on what they take. So maybe start with Amanda, please. Amanda? Hi. Um, well, I take vitamin B12 every day. I take a high dose because people over 50, obviously not me. No, no, I am. Um, people over 50 uh, don't absorb vitamin B12 as well, B12 as well. So that's whether their meat is or whatever they are. It's still wise to supplement vitamin B12 when you're over 50. So I take a high dose every day of that. Um, I'm very passionate about B12. I have to do my PhD on it at the moment. So it wouldn't be good if I came down with B12 deficiency in the middle of that. Um, I take a uh, multivitamin. I take that mainly for the selenium and the iodine. I make sure I take a multi that it's got at least 100 micrograms of iodine and, and about 60 micrograms of selenium. Uh, those are nutrients that are quite lacking in Australian soils, unfortunately, where our food is grown. And so they're of concern to all people in Australia, not just people on a plant-based diet. Um, so that's something to be aware of. You can use iodized salt, and you can eat Brazil nuts for iodine, and you can take them Brazil nuts for selenium and iodized salt for iodine, but I prefer to play it safe because it's still, you know, just better to, I think, make sure you get enough. And then I take uh, DHA, I take 200 milligrams a day of that, and um, that's to hopefully keep my brain healthy so I don't get demented too soon. Um, 
I like to focus on B12, so I take the vitamin B12 supplement, as well as vitamin C for adrenals, and I also like to have a good quality greens powder for extra nutrients. Is everybody comfy? I've <laughs> got a bit of a long list. <laughs> and this is just because um, I've come through a pregnancy and breastfeeding journey, otherwise my list would not go this long, so I'm just going to run through it really quickly. I'm just going to run through it my head on my shelf. So I am supplementing with a vitamin D and I'm getting out in the sun every single day. I'm also taking a um, multivitamin and that has as well really high levels of iodine in it because again, with pregnancy, really high levels of iodine are required. Um, it also focuses a lot on iron, but I am taking an extra iron on top of that because again, pregnancy just takes a lot of iron. These little brains, I take a lot of iron from you. Um, I'm also taking an EPA, a green supplement as well, just when my diet is not super on point. Otherwise, I'd love to have green smoothies and juice every day. Sometimes I just don't get around to it. Um, I'm also taking a pregnancy probiotic. Can you speak in this? Oh, sounds good. And I take vitamin B12, and at the moment, um, I don't want to get sick, so I've been having a lot of vitamin C every day in the powder, because I'm about to start a vegan speaking tour, and I don't want to get sick. Um, so I just wanted to mention that being vegan and promoting veganism is really important and um, by everyone using your own skills, your own expertise and your own passions, these things are really important to inspire other people and it's a great way of getting the message out there. And all of these ladies on the panel here, they're using their, their expertise in the areas that they've studied to spread the vegan message and educate people about the right ways that we should be eating on a plant-based and vegan diet. So um, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are interested in maybe studying naturopathy or nutrition and um, or dietetics. And I myself actually am an accredited naturopath, um, nutritionist and Western herbalist, but I, I don't practice it anymore. And I remember when I was at college, one of my lecturers, he said, he said to me, um, you know, every in the, one out of 15 of you who's studying this today is going to practice. And I remember thinking, yeah, that's not me. I'm going to practice, it'll be fine. But I, I didn't after that. So I just want everyone to share um, what they studied and whether or not you'd suggest it. And keep in mind, you know, sometimes you may not be able to get a job from these sort of things and you might have to be creating your own jobs. So I'd just like to share about your study. Would you suggest that to others? Well, I, I studied quite a lot actually. So first of all, I did a science degree in physiology and biochemistry. Uh, so that was three years full time. And then I did a one year full time graduate through Deakin University in human nutrition. And then I did a um, graduate diploma in nutrition and dietetics at QUT. And then I, I converted that to a master's in uh, nutrition and dietetics. Um, you do need to do a minimum of four years full time to become an accredited um, practicing dietitian or accredited nutritionist. Um, and there's an ongoing program of education that you, you have to every year get a certain number of points and, and keep studying and keep learning. And you do have to abide by a code of ethics as well. I definitely recommend it. I think it's good that more people know about nutrition uh, in the population. But um, I would say yes, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a great um, earning, uh, you know, earner at the moment. Um, because, you know, I, I only do plant-based nutrition. So if someone comes to me and they want to eat animal products, they say, well, you know, that's your choice, but I'm not going to support that. I, I'm not going to do a real plan with that. Um, so, because I'm a specialist and I don't want to just be a generalist. So, um, yeah, study nutrition, uh, go to an accredited university to do it, it's what I recommend, do an accredited course, and um, good luck if anyone wants to do it. Um, I studied a Bachelor of Health and Science, and that was a four year degree. And I would definitely recommend anybody who's interested in bettering their health or finding out. Finding out as much as you can about food and nutrition, um, it's a really great path to follow. So I also studied a Bachelor of Health Science Naturopathy, um, which means that we study Western Herbal Medicine and Nutrition as well. Um, what I would recommend is that our industry is changing and um, people coming out with advanced diplomas are no longer going to be covered by health funds and the industry is definitely moving away from advanced diplomas or anything under a bachelor. So 
So that is the four year degree. Uh, and that is generally where the industry is heading. So depending on if you are wanting to practice and if this is you know, what you want to make a career of, you're really going to be wanting to look at that when you're having a good school choices. If it's for your own interest, there's other wonderful colleges out there that you can study and look at, but just know that, yeah, it's, it's not really going to um, be where the industry is heading. And yeah, that's a good point because I did advanced diplomas, so I would have to do more study to be able to do the bachelor and to get all the... Um, the health fund rebates and stuff like that so um, keep those things in mind and if you if you just want to learn about um, vegan health there's some good online courses you can do there's great textbooks you can get there's great books you can read um, Michael Greger from nutritional fact, nutritionfacts.org he just released an amazing book called how not to die and I'd really suggest you check that out it's pretty cool um, and I just, what I was talking about before about everyone's skills and expertise and experience, everyone has different things that they like and that they're aware of and as you can see everyone on the panel, we come from different areas, we're interested in different things and you know we're not saying one person's right or one person's wrong, um, but um, everyone's doing promoting the lifestyle in their own way. But I'd like to talk about um, what the difference is, Amanda, you said, in your, and you're a dietitian. So, and we've got Holly and um, Sarah who are naturopaths here. Can you explain what the difference is to people? Because people might not know that. Well, I, re I know what a dietitian is because I am one. So maybe if I speak about that, so um, yeah. So the, to be what's called the collective dietitian, or collective practicing dietitian in Australia, that's what we call a protective term. You often hear people say that, and that means that you can't just call yourself that, put a sign out and practice, or you get into trouble with somebody. Um, it means that um, people that come and see me with the, um, on a, a healthcare plan from their doctor can get Medicare rebates and private health and insurance rebates as well. And as I said, to do that, you need a minimum of four years of an accredited of nutrition and dietetics course at an accredited university in Australia. So if you want to become a dietitian, you need to make sure that you do choose an accredited course. Uh, so that's four years full time. It's uh, science based. Um, and then when you finish, you need to, um, as I said, do an ongoing program of professional development and education. That could include um, reading scientific journals, uh, you have to keep a lot of what you do, uh, going to conferences, doing courses, that type of thing. Uh, for example, I'm doing my PhD at the moment, so that will count as points towards that. Um, and there's a code of ethics that dietitians have, which we have to abide by if we get into trouble. So for example, we can't advise people to take a supplement and then sell it to them, because obviously there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, so we don't do that. Um, and we can't, we can only advertise in certain ways, we can't do before and after pictures and that sort of thing, much as not like to, or get people to say how wonderful it was to come and see it. Um, so it's a bit like with the, you know, medical doctors can do that either. So that's what I know about being a dietitian. Um, I work with doctors quite a bit with referrals and that. Um, yeah, so maybe when the next case wants to explain. <coughs> So really, really similar um, things moving through our industry as well. Uh, we do need to have the Bachelor and there are um, also bodies accrediting our industry and it's becoming more and more accredited and recognised, which is fantastic. And uh, also really similar things that we need to go with the ongoing education and keep up our education points. I guess some of the core differences with the philosophy really lies in the study uh, where uh, obviously we're looking at nutrition and herbal medicine and we're coming at it from a blend of traditional and newer evidence uh, and so people can kind of pick and choose different areas where they're looking at and I guess um, traditional wisdom comes through um, you know the old texts of herbal medicine that we're looking at that some of the lesser known herbs maybe don't have a huge name like everyone knows about echinacea you know it's been studied to the cahoots and we've got really really fantastic scientific evidence to promote things like that and looking at the exact dosage so it's a bit of a blend now between um, the scientific kind of model and approach and a bit of traditional wisdom but all the things that Amanda was saying you know about um, keeping up with education points and making sure you're having a four year bachelor the accreditation really similar. While you're there, Holly, um, you just had a baby girl, Zephyr, three months, four months old. 
and first event you've been involved in, as we've said, and I'd just like you to give some tips for people um, how you change your diet and your supplement regime to make sure you and your baby had everything you need, because that's one of your favourite topics now, isn't it? So, with the supplements, basically I just went overboard. I went everything that could possibly, you know, be an area of contention, I did, because I had horrible morning sickness for the first trimester, so obviously diet wobbly, and then after having Zephyr, diet wobbly, you know, having dinners at 3 a.m. sometimes, <laughs> that sort of gap. So I made sure I was supplementing, which you've all heard about. Uh, my diet, I was in the peak of my pregnancy once I was eating again after first trimester in summer, so it was very, very much um, high raw, high carb kind of diet, and I just, I couldn't stop, you know, I just chowed out a watermelon like it was going out of fashion. Um, and that's what my body was really, really craving. I wasn't really into the fat so much, but definitely into um, slightly high protein than I guess the, the um, conventional high carb diets. I was definitely having protein powder in, um, in my shakes and having a lot of um, beans and legumes and things with dinners. Towards the end of my pregnancy, I started really craving the fats, like hummus, like it was going out of fashion, avocados, nuts, seeds. So it was obviously something changing in my development as I was coming towards the end of my pregnancy. And this carried through um, really for the first two months after having my daughter. Now it's just sparking off probably because it's starting to get warmer again uh, and my diet's balancing out a little bit. So now what I would really encompass and say, it's a really even split of all three of the macronutrients, so the protein, carbs, and fats probably just a touch lower on the fats, touch higher on the protein and carbs, but that's really kind of the balance that I'm looking at the moment. Um, Sarah, I'd like you to talk about, you're very passionate about um, creating a vegan pantry, and um, I'd like you to share um, what you think are the most important things to stocking a vegan pantry for a wholesome and nutrient-dense diet. Thanks. Um, so some quick tips to make stocking and preparing your vegan pantry easy is to buy in bulk, if possible, um, to store foods in jars out of sunlight, and this will help keep the nutrients intact. In um, make big batches of lentils, chickpeas, and black beans, and, and freeze them as individual servings, so, so that you can take them out separately and easily and conveniently add them to soups, curries, um, dips, salads, etc. Um, and also when stocking your vegan pantry, one of the most fundamental things to do is to ensure that you have a good base and big variety of grains, legumes, spices, nuts and seeds. And labelled in jars always helps. And these will become your base ingredients for most meals. Thanks, Sarah. And um, if you're interested in getting a copy of Sarah's um, vegan pantry list, would you like to come and see her afterwards and give... Um, have you got a card? Yeah, she, I'll give you a card and you can email her and she'll email that back to you. Um, and I'd just like um, everyone to just talk about what you're working on at the moment, just to round off the session. And um, if you have particular questions about the things we've asked, please see these ladies afterwards or follow them online and have a look at their websites. And um, Holly, what are you working on? What's your new thing, 2016? So I'm just emerging out of my baby cave right now. <laughs> But I really, really would like to spread a bit more information about vegan pregnancy uh, and especially breastfeeding. So I just last week put up a YouTube video first in a series of vegan pregnancies. So that one's just about preconception and getting healthy before you fall pregnant. And then I hope to follow that up with uh, a bit more about my journey and breastfeeding. So generally online, I'm not going to be practicing for the rest of the year, um, but these lovely ladies are here, so <laughs> feel free to have a chat to them, but definitely online with me, um, on Facebook, Instagram all the time, and YouTube definitely is where I'm going to be hit up next. Um, so what I'm really focusing on is helping people transition to a vegan, um, vegan or vegetarian diet. So helping, and also helping already established vegans and vegetarians optimise their health. Um, well, I'm pretty busy with study at the moment, doing research as part of my PhD. Uh, I have my private practice in West End, where I see people mostly that um, are already vegan and want to have their diets checked out, or people that want to go vegan, or people that don't actually want to go vegan, but um, they come to me or they've been sent to me, they might have diabetes or high cholesterol or high blood pressure or heart disease, 
and they're willing to go on a plant-based diet because they get good effects from that. I'm also writing an e-book on the moment to help people to adopt a whole foods plant-based diet because I think that um, too many people are sort of going a little bit overboard with all the deliciousness of um, the processed foods, which um, none of them existed. We couldn't even just go into a supermarket and buy soy milk or anything when I went vegan. So I've always learned to make everything from scratch and don't buy any of those foods normally. But I've, I've put together, you can download it for free from my website, just a, a brief one-page summary of how to be healthy on a vegan diet, very basic and easy and um, minimum to eat from each of the food groups. So hopefully that will help people. Oh, so the website is uh, humanherbivore.com. You're welcome to go there and download. There's a couple of leaflets as well. It's free download. You don't have to put in your email address or anything. I'm not great at you know doing all that harvesting, whatever you call it. Um, you just download it, you know. So yeah, feel, feel free to do that. Thanks. I think all our cards and flyers are off on that very back table. So if anyone doesn't grab us on the way out, then yeah, we're all found at the back table. Um, yeah, that's a good point you said there, Amanda, because the vegan diet, um, yeah, 20 years ago when I became vegan, 33 years ago when you became vegan, it, you didn't have all these options and it was easy. You could quite easily lose weight and eat really healthily because you really didn't have many options. Nowadays, it's quite easy to put on a bit of weight because there's too many cakes around or like cake. And, um, you know, people just think, we always think, oh, it's vegan, it's fine. But, you know, not everything that's vegan is actually good for you nowadays, especially if it's processed and in a package. <laughs> Sorry, Holly, you don't want to hear that? <laughs> um, so, yeah, just remember those, please. And um, I just want, I'm just going to end the, the session um, with the ladies. I'm just going to ask all of them. I'd like to know just a top tip on how um, to make all the these vegan diets and these concepts easy for people to understand and, and practical to use. So if you can go out after this session and say to someone who doesn't know about, say, um, vegan nutrition, if you could just give them a tip. Um, I guess my tip would be uh, don't just cut things out, add things in. Don't try and emulate your previous non-vegan diet because it probably wasn't very good because over 50% of Australians die prematurely from diet-related diseases. So just be aware of that, that as, as a country we don't eat very well. So I guess for me it's like go back to basics, learn how to cook some delicious dishes, cook curries with, with lentils and Mexican food with beans and things like that. Um, think of the food groups of green vegetables, eat some every day, red, orange, yellow, other colourful vegetables, eat some every day. Eat whole grains, avoid the white stuff, it's, it's not as nutritious, so that's, you know, the, um, go for the brown rice and everything instead. And, um, yeah, better, and fresh food, but there's something for the others to say that, sorry. Um, yeah, I agree, don't just cut things out, make sure you're adding things in. Um, overload your diet with the good food and, and surely enough the bad food will disappear. Um, practice, it takes a lot of practice um, and also to not be so hard on yourself um, and by doing something is better than doing nothing. Keep up the variety, um, something, you know, we can fall into a rut of, oh I always buy capsicum and zucchini and that's kind of what's in the groceries uh, and to keep up variety what I like to do is follow um, a different blogger, every now and again I'll just pull a different uh, recipe book or a different website and just have my whole meal plan that week using a lot of their ingredients just to get different flavour profiles um, and it, yeah don't just cut out replace but eat a lot more plant-based food is generally a lot lower in calories um, you know these animal products are often what I like to consider apex food so they're really really dense in nutrients and they're also really dense in calories so you've got to replace that not just you know a little blob on the plate you've got to replace the calories and the nutrients that would be coming from that little blob on the plate so yeah eat lots of Thank you, lovely ladies. Um, could everyone please give a round of applause? And I'd just like to thank everyone for sharing your expertise with us today. And um, if you want to find more information, please find them online on their websites, social media, um, cards at the back. And um, yeah, just please share something new that you've learned today with someone who doesn't know it. That would be great. And um, up next, I'm going to talk with Alejandro Sancino from Urbane Restaurant and Fen Food. So please stick around for that Q&A. Thank you.